Good morning, church. As we get started, would you bow with me for a quick word? I'm going to ask the Lord to bless my message and bless our time together. Father God, we're so grateful for this church and for this body of believers, as Laura said. God, we're grateful that you placed that word on her heart about uh, the role that we each have to play in this beautiful, uh, special community that you are assembling here. God, I pray that as we dig into uh, your word, to uh, the story God, that you will bring this to life for us. Uh, We pray that the people will jump off the pages, God, that we will leave this place with wisdom that can only come from ultimate truth, which we can find in your word. God, I pray that as I speak today, my words would be your words, and above all, that you would be glorified. Amen. One time when our two sons, Harrison and Asher, were about six and three, Asher ran into the room to Jeff, and he said, Dad, Dad, you got to see my new thing. And Jeff said, well, what you got there, buddy? And Asher goes, I got a magic quarter. And Jeff said, oh, sorry, Asher. He's in the back. (laughs) He's already hiding his face in embarrassment. And Jeff said, well, buddy, what makes this quarter magic? And Asher said, well, it can turn invisible, and it can blast through buildings, and it can blow stuff up. And Jeff said, well, where in the world did you get a magic quarter? And Asher said, well, Harrison sold it to me for two regular quarters. (laughs) It took a minute for that one to land for a couple of years. Um, As I was digging into this week's passage uh, to the story this week, this is what came to mind. This story about my sons, because one of them deceived the other. And today, in our final week of the Errors Tour, we're going to be looking at brothers. We're going to be digging into the story of Jacob and Esau, twins. And so, throughout this Errors Tour, we have seen that the people that have been our focal points are people that we generally refer to as heroes of the faith. Right in week one, we had Abram, Abraham. In week two, we had Peter. In week three, we had the prophet Elijah. And these are people we think about as heroes of the faith, right? Well, I would not hold anyone up from today's story as a hero of the faith. I would not hold them up as exemplary believers. I would not hold them up as exemplary humans. And I think that's important for us to think about, especially when we think about how we present these biblical stories to our children. Because a lot of times, you know, we think about Jacob as a great man of the faith. When the book of Genesis, which is where we find our story, really isn't the story about heroes of the faith. It's the story about a loving God who continues to pursue his broken people again and again and again. And so today we're going to start with Jacob and Esau in Genesis chapter 25. We're actually going to begin with their parents. Remember in week one when we talked about Abram or Abraham and his wife Sarah, who in their old age uh, conceived and bore a child named Isaac. Well, this is that Isaac that we're starting with, and he's all grown up, and he has married a woman named Rebecca. And she, too, is having trouble conceiving a child. And so we see in Genesis 25, 21. Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was childless. The Lord answered his prayer, and his wife, Rebekah, became pregnant. The babies jostled each other within her, and she said, Why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord. And as I was reading this, I wondered about this word, jostled. And so I checked into some other translations. The message, which tends to put things pretty plainly, said the children tumbled and kicked inside her so much that she said, well, if this is the way it's going to be, why go on living? So these are not your regular run-of-the-mill butterfly sweet baby kicks. These babies are fighting inside her. And so God said to her, two nations are in your womb. And two peoples from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. So as a mother, I don't know how I would interpret this, right? You're so excited. uh, You've been wanting a baby for such a long time, and now you're pregnant with twins. But they're fighting so hard in there that you ask God, what's the point of this? And he tells you there's going to be division between your babies right from the beginning, 
And he tells you they're going to do things backwards. The older is going to serve the younger. And this is backwards because in this ancient context, the custom was that most of what belonged to the father would be passed down to the firstborn son upon the father's death. And this is called a birthright. And we see some examples of the system in our modern context. One of them, a little bit, is the British monarchy, right? We have the newly crowned King Charles with his sons, William and Harry. And as the oldest, William is the heir to the throne. And we jokingly call Harry, the little brother, the spare, right? And Harry released a book earlier this year where he talked about all the ways that William was supposedly favored, as they were growing up. He always had the bigger bedroom, and in fact, when Camilla moved in, she turned Harry's bedroom into a closet, supposedly. And as they got older, William had more um, opportunities and more protection. And so as the older brother, William receives the birthright. But here in this ancient context, God is saying things are going to look different. The older will serve the younger. In verse 24, we see... When the time came for her to give birth, there were two boys, twin boys, in her womb. The first to come out was red, and we know that when babies are pink, that's a good thing. That's a sign of health, but this appears to be something different. This baby had a really ruddy complexion, and commentators believe he might have had red hair as well, and his whole body was like a hairy garment, so they named him Esau, which means hairy. After this, His brother came out with his hand grasping Esau's heel. So he was named Jacob, which comes from the Hebrew word for heel. So the babies aren't even fully out into the world yet. And already the younger one's trying to pull the older one back in. So this does not bode well for their future. Does not bode well. So Isaac was 60 years old when Rebekah gave birth to them. The boys grew up, and Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the open country, while Jacob was content to stay at home among the tents. Isaac, who had a taste for wild game, loved Esau, but Rebekah loved Jacob. So we see a bit of favoritism here. Once, when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country famished. He said to Jacob, quick, let me have some of that red stew. I'm famished. I don't know why he talks like that in my head. I did this in first service too. (laughs) That's why he was also called Edom, which means red. Jacob replied, first, sell me your birthright. And I have to wonder, was he joking? Or did he really think that his brother would do this? Sell him his birthright for some soup. Look, I'm about to die, Esau said. What good is the birthright to me? See, there I go. But Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. He ate and drank and then got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright. And so I really hope that was some good stew. Really hope that was good. And what is Esau's error here? Well, he gives away his birthright for a temporary pleasure. And at this time in ancient Israel, it was the custom that all the sons got something when the father died, but the oldest received a double portion. And he received the father's authority as the head of the family when the father passed away. And we're told in scripture that Isaac's property was extensive. He had huge flocks and and, and herds and silver and gold and servants. So it was a large estate. And at the end of the passage, we see, so Esau despised his birthright or his inheritance. That's how the NIV puts it. But I like the way the message translates it. That's how Esau shrugged off his rights as the firstborn. Yeah, not that important. He's living for the moment. We'll catch Esau years down the road and ask him how important that inheritance is once he's given it away. So Esau's error is shrugging off his inheritance. And what can we learn from this as believers in 2023 who don't participate in this system of birthright anymore? At least I hope we don't. Hope we don't show this kind of favoritism. And more importantly, what can we as believers in 2023 who are living on the other side of God's full revelation in Jesus Christ? Well, we see in the book of Hebrews... 
In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. The writer of Hebrews is telling his congregation that Jesus is the firstborn son of God. And he's also telling them Jesus is fully God through whom he made the universe. And that's where that Trinitarian message comes in. And, and the Trinity is one of those difficult doctrines, that difficult piece of theology that's hard for us to grasp. And it gets even more difficult when we solely refer to Jesus as the Son of God. Because we're like, well, are they separate and they're distinct, but they're all one? But we're told that Jesus is also fully God. But as God's firstborn Son, according to the writer of Hebrews, Jesus is his heir. Everything that belongs to God belongs to Jesus. And so now let's hop to Romans chapter 8, verse 12. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. There is so much beautiful theology in the book of Romans, specifically in this eighth chapter. The apostle Paul is telling us that when we received the Holy Spirit, that is when we made the decision to follow Jesus, to make him the Lord of our lives, we were adopted as sons and daughters of the king of the universe. And we're not meant to be slaves to God. And this would have been significant to the people at this time because the religious systems they'd been participating in dictated that humanity served God as slaves. Not so with the one true God. With God, we enjoy a higher status. We are family. We are sons and daughters of the king. So then if we're sons and daughters, we are heirs. That is, we are set to inherit his property and his authority. But we were just told in that Hebrews passage that Jesus is the firstborn. Jesus was appointed heir of all things. But did you catch in Romans that we are co-heirs with Christ? We are co-heirs with Christ. We inherit what he inherits. That's huge. And that inheritance is being kept for us until the time is right for us to receive it. And we see that in 1 Peter 1. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. So we're jumping through the New Testament here to put these pieces together. In Hebrews 1, we see that Jesus is the firstborn of God and he is fully God. In Romans 8, we are children of God and co-heirs with Christ. And in 1 Peter 1, we will receive our inheritance in full when Jesus returns to set the world right. And we spent a lot of time breaking down this concept in our series several ago called On Earth as in Heaven. That was a big one. And if you haven't uh, taken part in that series, go back to the app, go back to the website, to the podcast, because there we really did a deep dive into our theology around this around the kingdom of God and what that is and how we participate in it. But this is the biggest and best news, and I'm always so sad that there is no way for us to grasp the fullness of this in our current context. How can we grasp the fullness of the new creation? But this broken world will be restored to the way God intended, and if you want to know what that was, go back to the beginning of Genesis 
And there will be no more sickness and no more pain and no more death and no more sadness. And somehow, all of the things that we have been doing in our earthly lives to build for the kingdom will be brought into that new world by the resurrection of Jesus. Somehow, don't have the answer, sorry, never will until that day. But we will also live in perfect community with one another, and most importantly, with God. And that was his intention. And this is our birthright as followers of Jesus. But like Esau, how often do we sacrifice our birthright for things that fade? For momentary pleasures, earthly delights. We choose the temporal over the eternal. And we invest our time and our money and our emotions and our thoughts and our bodies into things that fade. Matthew 6.21 says, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. If people looked at your life, what would they think you treasure more than anything else? Would it be things that fade? Or would it be your inheritance your birthright as a child of God. As a child of God, your birthright makes Esau's look ridiculous. Cattle, gold, silver, camels, meh. Because you are set to inherit the new world. We are set to inherit the new world in the future, but also now. Remember when Jesus came, he brought the kingdom with him, and we participate in it now. He came so that you can have life, life, and more life, the abundant life. God wants you to have a life of abundance. And so what's keeping you from it? What is your bowl of soup? What's your bowl of soup? What is something temporary that you are choosing over your inheritance? Is it a lie? Is it a substance addiction? Is it an addiction to pornography? Is it infidelity? Is it sexual immorality of some kind? Is it hatred? Is it an unwillingness to forgive? Because in the moment, these things will satisfy you, but ultimately, they will destroy you. Because the wages of sin is death. God wants the abundant life for you. When you hold up that thing, that bowl of soup against your promised inheritance, it looks stupid, right? And we laugh at Esau, but we do this too, all the time. Why are we shrugging off our inheritance for bowls of soup? We're going to move on now through chapter 26 into 27, because we spent some time in 26 on week one. The next scripture, excuse me, doesn't pick up with the boys until Esau is about 40. Scripture says he's 40. And and we're not told a lot of specifics about what's happened in this time, but we know that Esau was a man of the outdoors. He was a hunter. Uh, We can also gather that he's not the brightest. He's impulsive. And we know that he married not one but two women. They were outsiders. This was a no-no. And we're told that they were a source of grief and bitterness to his parents, especially Rebecca. And that may be one of the reasons that she loved Jacob best. Esau, Isaac favored Esau. Rebecca favored Jacob. And he was more of an indoorsy fella. He was quiet. And we know that he is shrewd. And he's not afraid to use deception to get what he wants. And apparently, Isaac and Rebecca made no effort to hide their favoritism. And this is so damaging, right? Here's just a little error on the part of the parents. There are many. But maybe you know this. Maybe you are the favored sibling. Maybe you are the forsaken sibling. This is so damaging. And it sets up this rivalry between these two brothers, and the rivalry is strong. And so here we go in chapter 27. When Isaac was old and his eyes were so weak that he could no longer see, he called for Esau, his older son, and said to him, My son, here I am, he answered. 
Isaac said, I am now an old man, and I don't know the day of my death. Now then, get your equipment, your quiver and bow, and go out to the open country to hunt some wild game for me. Prepare me the kind of tasty food I like and bring it to me to eat so that I may give you my blessing before I die. Isaac is sensing that his time is growing short. We know that he goes on to live some years after this, but he's wanting to get his affairs in order. And he's wanting to give Esau a blessing. This is different than the birthright. That's already done. That cannot be taken back. Esau gave that up, shrugged it off. This is a patriarchal blessing. It has nothing to do with material things or with birthright, birth order. It's just a father speaking aloud his hopes and dreams for his son. But it carries weight. And the speaking aloud part is powerful. And we know that it can also not be undone. Once it's out, it's out. So that's what's happening here. And we also see that this seems to be very important to Rebecca and Jacob. In verse 5, we see, Now Rebecca was listening as Isaac spoke to his son Esau. When Esau left for the open country to hunt game and bring it back, Rebecca said to her son Jacob, Look, I overheard your father say to your brother Esau, Bring me some game and prepare me some tasty food to eat, so that I may give you my blessing in the presence of the Lord before I die. Now, my son, listen carefully and do what I tell you. Go out to the flock and bring me two choice young goats so I can prepare some tasty food for your father just the way he likes it. Then take it to your father to eat so that he may give, it, give you his blessing before he dies. Jacob said to Rebekah, his mother, But my brother Esau is a hairy man while I have smooth skin. What if my father touches me? I would appear to be tricking him and would bring down a curse on myself rather than a blessing. His mother said to him, My son, let the curse fall on me. Just do what I say and go get them for me. So he went and got them and brought them to his mother, and she prepared some tasty food just the way his father liked it. Then Rebekah took the best clothes of Esau, her older son, which she had in the house, and put them on her younger son Jacob. She also covered his hands and the smooth part of his neck with the goat skins. Then she handed her son Jacob the tasty food and the bread she had made. My first question is this, how hairy is Esau? <laughs> We're all thinking it. If they think that goat skins are going to trick, uh, trick Isaac, how hairy is Esau? Also, how smelly? Right? How smelly. But my second thing is this. Jacob seems to come about his dishonesty honestly because his mother, Rebecca, is also a trickster. What kind of a mother does this to her husband and her sons? And so Jacob listens to his mom and he covers himself in goat hair and he takes the food into his dad's tent. And here's what we see in scripture. Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you told me. Please sit up and eat some of my game so that you may give me your blessing. Isaac asked his son, how'd you find it so quickly, my son? The Lord your God gave me success. He replied, he's bringing God into this. Then Isaac says to Jacob, come near so I can touch you, my son, to know whether you are really my son Esau or not. Jacob went close to his father Isaac, who touched him and said, the voice is the voice of Jacob, but the hands are the hands of Esau. He did not recognize him, for his hands were hairy, like those of his brother Esau. So he proceeded to bless him. Are you really my son Esau, he asked. I am, he replied. So we see there is no end to what Jacob will do to deceive his own father. He brings God into it, and he lies to his father multiple times. So why does Jacob do this? He's already got the birthright. Esau's word is his bond. Why does Jacob feel the need to trick his dad like this? Well, his mom told him to, but as a man in this culture, and especially as the holder of the birthright, when his father died, he would have authority over his mother. So why does he do this? Why does he take control and manipulate the situation to work it to his advantage? Jacob's error is a lack of trust. A lack of trust. And what can we learn from this? Well, we've seen God promises us the abundant life. But often we're not entirely sure that he'll come through. We get impatient because he works on a different timetable than we do sometimes. And we see ways that we can control and manipulate other people to get what we want. 
And we think that if other people succeed, we lose, and there's not enough to go around. We might go for promotions or more money, maybe at the expense of people we view as our competitors, maybe at the expense of our own family. We might cheat a little bit. We might fib the numbers a little bit. We might uh, uh, be dishonest in the dark when no one is watching. Why? Because we don't think God is going to come through for us. We don't trust. So Isaac realizes what has happened, and he's heartbroken, and Esau, understandably, is furious. And Jacob has already taken his birthright, and now this. And Isaac says, there's nothing I can do. Your life, Esau, is going to be difficult. You will live by the sword, remember week two of the series, and this land that you hunt and farm will not be kind to you. But there will come a day when you get restless and you throw off Jacob's yoke from around your neck. You'll be free from him. And Esau held a grudge, and he said he was going to kill his brother Jacob the first chance he got. And so Jacob has really done it this time. Rebecca hears that Esau is angry, and so she tells Jacob that he's going to go live with her brother Laban. And I love what she says. She says, when your brother is no longer angry with you and forgets about what you did to him, as if that will happen, I'll send for you, and then you can come home. And something tells me they're going to be waiting for a long time. But Isaac blesses Jacob again. This time he knows that it's Jacob, and they send him on his way to his uncle's place. And on the way, Jacob has a dream where he sees this staircase. Some translations call it a ladder. That's where we get the expression Jacob's ladder. And, you, and he sees angels moving up and down the staircase. And God says to him, I will always be with you, and you and your descendants will be a blessing to all people. Remember from week one, that's the Abrahamic covenant that God made. And so here God is renewing this with Jacob, despite the many ways he has manipulated and been awful to his family. So Jacob goes to his uncle, and he falls madly in love with his cousin, Rachel. Times were different. And he asked to marry her. And his uncle, who was also not an exemplary human, his uncle Laban says, okay, you can marry her, but you got to work for me for seven years before you can do it. And Jacob says, okay, I love her that much. And so he does, but then his uncle tricks him into marrying his other cousin, Leah. And I wonder, first of all, how Leah felt. That's terrible. Again, this family, so much material for the error series. But I wonder how Jacob felt being on the receiving end of deception. Right, a taste of his own medicine. And so he agrees to work another seven years so he can actually marry Rachel. And with Leah and Rachel and their two servants, he has 12 sons and a daughter in the time that he lives with them. And these 12 sons grow up to be the 12 tribes of Israel. See, God is working through the deception, through the errors, to build his kingdom. And so God tells, tells Jacob one day to take his family and go back home to the land of his father. It's time. And so they do, and they sneak away from his uncle, more deception, and the uncle pursues them, but God says, leave them be. And so they're free to go. And when he gets to his homeland, he sends for his brother Esau. He's thinking, I need to try to patch things up if I'm going to stay here. And Esau says, I'll see you, but I will have 400 men with me. And so Jacob is scared. And he gets together this huge offering of hundreds of sheep and cattle and rams and camels and donkeys and bulls as a peace offering for his brother. And as Jacob is preparing to enter his homeland, he begins to pray. And this is one of the things that he says to God. I am unworthy of all the kindness and faithfulness you have shown your servant. And so we begin to see some repentance here, some turning back to God. We know from Scripture that Jacob continues to make errors along the way, but we see some repentance and some turning back and some recognition of his faults. And so in further preparation to go back home, he sends his wives and children ahead of him, and he is alone for the night. And in 
the most fascinating and significant moment in scripture, we see that Jacob wrestled with God that night. Wrestled. And at daybreak, Jacob sustains a hip injury where his hip is wrenched out of its socket. This is quite the struggle that he's had with God. And so God tells him in Genesis 32, 28, then the man, whom we later understand to be God, said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. The significance of this moment. This is the crux of what we have been getting at in this series. God's chosen people are named by him Israel because they have wrestled with God and they wrestle with humans, but they overcome. They fear. They doubt God. They make uh, bad choices. They choose violence. They shrug off their inheritance. They fail to trust God. They make errors, but they overcome because of God's great love for them. Israel. And because we are adopted as sons and daughters by the king of the universe, this is our story too. Like Jacob, we wrestle with God and we wrestle with humans, but we overcome. Jacob looked up, and there was Esau coming with his 400 men. So he divided the children among Leah, Rachel, and the two female servants. He put the female servants and their children in the front, Leah and her children next, and Rachel and Joseph in the back. Favoritism. And he himself went on ahead and bowed down to the ground seven times as he approached his brother. But Esau ran to meet Jacob and embraced him. And he threw his arms around his neck and kissed him, and they wept. And so we appear to have a happy reunion here right? And to some degree, we do. Esau appears to have forgiven his brother, Jacob, for all the pain that he has caused. And it seems that uh, he has done what his father predicted in Genesis 27, which is to throw uh, his brother's yoke off of his neck. But in the verses that follow, Esau offers to accompany Jacob back home to the homeland, but Jacob refuses. And it's like he doesn't fully trust Esau, And by extension, he doesn't fully trust God, even though he has seen God face to face. And God has renewed his promise to Jacob more than once. But he fails to trust him again. And his error remains. But we see, as we follow the story of Jacob, that God does continue to reside with Jacob. And God does bless Jacob and his descendants, and that they are a blessing to the whole world. In this story about these two flawed brothers who are pivotal people in the story of God, we are invited to see that our tendencies to shrug off our inheritance as the children of God and our tendency to fail to trust God, those tendencies are not unique to us. These men, through whom God began to build his kingdom and his people, are just that. They're men. They are human. They are fallible. They are prone to error. Just like the other men that we've examined in this series. And I hope, our hope is that we can find comfort in the fact that throughout our story, We've had Old Testament stories. We've had New Testament stories in this series. Throughout our story, God identifies broken people through whom he builds his kingdom. And God has identified you as a kingdom builder. Will you shrug off your birthright as a child of God? Will you fail to trust God? Or will you choose the abundant life that he offers for you? Let's pray. God, we're grateful for the material for this series because what it does is it it comforts us, Lord, and we're grateful that you love broken people because that's what we are, broken people. 
And yet we enjoy this status, this high status as your children. And you want to give all that's yours to us. And God, we look forward to the day when you will make things right, when we will live in perfect community with you. But in the meantime, Lord, we ask for your provision and your peace as we continue to do the work of building your kingdom in the here and now. God, we love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.